So, in the, my lecture today has we start rhythm and harmony, C. V. Raman on the physics of mu musical instruments. Now, this talk was actually originally given at the Indian Academy of Sciences media meeting this year in Bangalore, where there was a special session in honor of 125th birth anniversary of C. V. Raman. So, this talk is prepared in that context and taken out of context, taken out of that setting, it might seem a little out of context. So, I will tell you what this talk is not. This talk is not a review of our current understanding of physics of musical instruments. And this talk is not about altogether everything of C. V. Raman. So, it is about C. V. Raman's work on uh, musical instruments and that is what I was originally commissioned to do for that academy meeting. And it is just a, a repeat of the same talk that I am giving here. Almost everything that I am going to talk about can be found in this book. This is a collection of is volume 3 of the collection of scientific papers of C. V. Raman. In, uh, it is published by the Indian, Acad Indian Academy of Sciences. And it contains 53 papers by Raman on acoustics, 21 of which are on musical instruments. And my talk essentially will cover in particular this, in, uh, <coughs> this work, 21 in, uh, papers on musical instruments. Now, C. V. Raman started working on acoustics very, very early. It is in, in 1906 when he was of age 16, already in, when he was studying in college and this is a contemporary picture from those days. Raman himself was a violin player. He had learned violin in, uh, in his young days and he, he had a very keen musical ear, very, very perceptive. And it is the curiosity that came with this uh, musical training and uh, musical perception that led him to do his work in acoustics. It actually started, his work on acoustics started inspired by musical instruments. And, uh, but the peak period of Raman's research work on acoustics spanned the years from 1907 to 1918. Most of that period he was in Calcutta and carried out mainly in, in the Association for the Cultivation of Science, this building in Bobaza Street, <coughs> as it was then. <coughs> and beyond about 1918, Raman just left acoustics and moved to optics. And you know, almost all work on acoustics came to an end. He kept writing papers, but mm, essentially summarizing work that he had already done before. So, this work, 21 papers on musical instruments that uh, I mentioned before, contains 13 papers on board strings, board instruments like you know, violin and violin family. One paper on <coughs> pianoforte, which is a struck string. Three papers on Indian string instruments, I will come to that towards the end of the talk. Three papers on percussion instruments. And one very extensive, very long review in Handbook der Physik on physics of musical instruments of all kinds, as known at that time. That was the most comprehensive review of its day. <coughs> A typical character of the papers of C. V. Raman on acoustics, as you read, you find that it is a fairly complete package. Each paper will contain some theoretical analysis and then he would have built some instrument and uh, done an experimental verification of that. And what he was after mainly was the nature of vibrations that give rise to the kind of you know, sounds that the instrument produces and the physical causes of this vibration, how, how you produce this vibration, what sustains these vibrations, how the energy transfer occurs, how you um, inject energy into the system 
and in, uh, all of those. Raman states very clearly his early inspiration on acoustics and uh, work on acoustics came from this book. He was presented a copy of this book by his father when he was very young and he was, he just took it, took to it like fish to water. This is a book published in 1875 by Helmholtz. This was the earliest treatise on uh, physics of music. It's called the Sensations of Tone, Theory of Music. Ayuka Library has a copy of this book. Ayuka Library doesn't have a copy of Papers of C.V. Ram, but it has a copy of this book. <laughs> so, uh, and this is indeed mm, a very extensive and uh, a very authoritative book. In fact, a fair amount of textbook studies that we do in early college these days about instruments, string instruments and so on, are all there in this book. This is 1875, this is the English version published in 1875. The German version was published earlier. It's more than 100 years old. So, starting from here, Raman took off from there and then developed his analysis further beyond what Helmholtz had done in his book. But before I get to Raman's work per se, I'd just like to introduce a few concepts in, uh, in uh, musical instruments and in, uh, a few jargons, let us say, which in, uh, are of interest and which were of interest then. And this has to do with the perception of musical tone. The tone at that time was described by two parameters. One is called the pitch, which is the dominant frequency of a tone, dominant single frequency of a tone. And then there was this thing called timber. The timber is a kind of richness of the tone which is provided by the harmonic and overtone content of the note. Today, we have added one more dimension to it. The modern description of a, of a tone will have not only these, but also this, which is called the envelope, which means the profile of the time variation of the note, which is characterized by a rise the hold and the decay of the note. All of that is important in giving this note a, a specific character. The fact that we do today because uh, we, we mention this today is because the study of uh, musical notes has moved beyond the frequency domain and has gone into time domain today. So today almost all the studies specifically emphasize time domain. Whereas in Raman's day and in Helmholtz's time, it was all about frequency domain. And both these are descriptions of the note in frequency domain. Now, just to give you some example, let's play a tone, I hope it plays. So I'll play that again. This is a monotone. It's uh, in the time domain character is like this, a pure sinusoid. And in frequency domain, it will be a, in a single frequency at 512 hertz. Now, if I add some overtones to it, you can hear that extra richness of the tone. So its timber is different. And in the frequency domain, you will see not only this dominant single pitch, which is at the same frequency, but also these other notes. And I was talking about envelope. This is an envelope of the same, in the, in the same note, which I played in the, in the, in the, uh, the second one. And it has got rise, hold, and decay. And 
you can hear. Now it almost begins to sound like an instrument. I will play it again. Like a horn or like an instrument. So now this is the frequency domain description of this tone. Now suppose this envelope was not there. Suppose it was a constant. This is the frequency domain description of this. So if you describe this in the frequency domain, as you can see, this is a dynamic range of about 1,000. You almost see no difference. You have to go to enormous dynamic range to be able to make a difference between these two in frequency domain. And this is the reason why a century ago, people were measuring frequencies all the time, were not did not un I mean, realize the importance of the envelope in describing the tonal quality. So anyway, be that as it may, what uh, people did at that time is mainly in frequency domain. But today we know the time domain is very important. And interestingly, in Raman's work, in some aspects of it, time domain becomes very important as well. OK, so now coming back to Raman's work. The first paper that Raman wrote on musical instrument was on this instrument. It's the ektara. Yeah, I'll go ahead. <clears throat> so this instrument was found to emit a note at um, twice the frequency of vibration. So clearly, when you hear it, you hear a high note. But it has got a very long string. If you plug this string, your frequency should be much lower. But what you hear is a frequency which is much higher. So this, of course, people have been hearing this for a long time. But Raman immediately found this that this was interesting. And then he figured that, I mean, this is what this paper says, that actually what you're hearing is, of course, the sound from this resonance box. The resonance box has a membrane here. So it's a flexible membrane. And when you plug this string, it's actually this membrane which is going up and down, which is giving you the sound. And this frequency of this going up and down is actually twice the frequency of the vibration of the string. Because when the string is pulled, in every oscillation, you have the end point of it making an excursion twice. So the tension, uh, tension uh, the uh, oscillation of tension on this is twice the, uh, at, at, uh, twice the frequency of the oscillation of the string itself. So imagine the string is there, and then you curve it this way, so there is a certain tension. And then when it comes back, it curve it that way, again there is this tension in the same direction. So it, during one period, this makes two oscillations. And that is how you get twice the frequency. So right from the beginning, right from the very first paper, the character of Raman's work on musical instruments was clear. It's not only about the vibration of the primary element, but it's the vibration of the whole instrument, which gives, gives the musical experience. And how the two things interplay, and how the rest of the instrument also contributes to our musical note. That's, that is a recurring theme in Raman's work. OK, so now I will come to the board string instruments. This contains the largest body of work that Raman did. And it, in fact, he became the world authority on board string instruments. So in a board string instrument, what you have is this bow carrying the point of contact of the string in, a, in the direction of bowing, and then it slips, and the string comes back. Now, there have been various conjectures before Raman as to how it, it actually operates. And, uh, there was an idea that when it moves along the bow string, it actually does not move with constant velocity, because as you uh, apply more and more tension, the velocity slows down. And then mm, later on, it slips back. So first thing Raman did was a device and experiment. 
to record the vibration of violin like you know, strings. So, so, it recorded on a moving film some bright you know, spot he attached some small mirror and uh, here he records the vibration of the string and the motion of the bow simultaneously. And from this experiment it is clear that in the forward motion the string exactly follows the motion of the bow. So, there is no slippage, there is no, no, no pull back and when it pulls back it just detaches and then comes back. And both happens at constant speed as you can see the slope is you know, such that you, there is no curvature in this. And then on with further experiments and also theoretical uh, um, uh, exposition, Raman um, uh, basically came <coughs> continued to develop the theory and overall I have summarized here several points that he has made over a number of papers, but most of his work on board string is also summarized in this big review in 1918 uh, uh, bulletin of Indian <coughs> Association for the Cultivation of Science. So, primary points of uh, concern are the motion consists of discontinuous velocity jumps, it goes then comes down. At both point the velocity v is equal to the velocity of the bow v b along and some other velocity v a which is against the bow when uh, it slips and comes back down and v a and v b are constant. And during one period of oscillation there need not be just one slippage, it could be multiple slippages could be either one or more velocity discontinuities per period of oscillation. And then Raman went on to classify the vibrations according to n. And this created a huge number of classes of oscillations because n can go from 1 to fairly large number in a practical value. What is also seen is that dv dx along the length is constant away from the discontinuity that means those things are straight lines. And the ratio of the velocity against to velocity along the bow is equal to n times x n over l, now I will explain what these are. L is the total length of the string and x n is the distance of the point of bowing from the nearest node of the nth harmonic. So now, given these, you can now fully construct the motion of the string. And Raman went on to construct the motions of the string based on this premise, starting from this. So th these are some examples. So this is, this is mm, uh, first type of vibration. There is only one velocity discontinuity per period. What, what difference is the relation of amplitude for uh, going and going? Uh, there must be one fixed factor. Uh, no, so uh, that gets fixed by the bowing point. And that's completely fixed for all of them. Yes. Mm, uh, and then mm, this is a second type of vibration, mm, two discontinuities. So, I have just shown two pictures with this mm, uh, paper is full of pages and pages of such pictures. So, once you have the velocity diagram, you can integrate it and produce a displacement diagram and then you can continue to construct other diagrams with respect to it and for every type of vibration you can have different types of um, uh, displacement diagrams. Displacement diagrams are important because you can measure them, you can click a photograph of the string and then see how it, um, uh, um, uh, how it is vibrating. So, these are examples of vibrations because the board string found a priori which means from theory, theoretically. Now, he is going to subject it to experiment. So, he 
of course, made that instrument much more elaborate. And uh, I'm sorry, this, this picture is a bit faint. But here are the examples of the vibration curves, which matches exactly what he predicts based on his uh, velocity curves and uh, the, the theoretical prediction of motion. So this is done entirely in time domain. He is not even talking about frequencies here. It's about modes and vibration curves are all in time domain. In fact, in one of his papers, he makes a statement that harmonic analysis should be discarded when it is not of, when it does not elucidate the required points. <clears throat> Now, once you have these vibration curves and the velocity curves, you can combine them to get force curves or energy curves. So, this is the frictional force curves at motion of the, at both points. And this, he found, was extremely important because this is a guide to pressure, speed, and location of Boeing. So, he is telling the violinist, if you want to excite this particular note, you should bow at this point with this pressure at this speed. Then you get the best possible uh, excitation of this particular node. So one of the instruments he built to do this in experiments was this. So this was a mechanically driven violin. So, in a, it's a fixed bow, and the violin goes up and down. It's uh, <laughs> or back and forth, rather, not up and down. And there are weights here, which carefully adjust the pressure of the bow on the violin. And there is an adjustment, which is perpendicular to the plane of the picture, which mm, can place the bow in contact with any part of the string on the violin. And, uh, this is the violin, which is, you see the, I mean, the, the bottom end of the violin is here, and the, the bridge is over here. <coughs> and this was driven by this, this is a bicycle wheel, and then some uh, you know, rope, and then somebody is sitting there and just running this manually. Very cheap setup, but very effective. From this, no. <laughs> I don't know whether even this uh, instrument is still there or not. You'll have to check in uh, cultivation of science. If it is there, you can reproduce it. <laughs> yeah, so, and this is the Stradivarius violin, which, <laughs> Well, the conditions of mu music would know is the best, most important uh, class of violin that you could have got that day. <laughs> All of the, the, this he did, his, the money came from his pocket, by the way. There was no government grant which was given, just given to do this experiment. Okay, so some of the results from that experiment, for example, are these. Uh, no, bowing pressure versus distance of both point from the bridge, then this is to sustain you know, steady vibration. Minimum bowing pressure versus velocity of bow. So many, many such curves and guides to musicians came out of this. And those musicians are guided more by their own experience. One of the things that he noted was that if you look at the required bowing pressure, as a function of frequency. At a resonance, you require more bowing pressure because you, are, you have to supply more energy. Finally, the um, energy that the instrument gives out is coming out from your own um, mechanical energy. So this is the primary note of that string when it's played. But there is a secondary broad resonance. And he correctly identified this as the resonance of the air column inside the body. And this is the resonance of the body and the bridge itself. 
and the resonance of the body on the bridge, when the body starts vibrating rapidly, then it becomes somewhat difficult to sustain in a, a contact of the bow with the violin in a, in a, in a proper manner. So you get, this, so this is actually an undes undesirable uh, aspect of any instrument. And what it produces here is called wolf note. <coughs> Again, violinists you know, or cellists would be you know, very familiar with this wolf note, but I'll just give you an example for those who are not familiar with this. So let's, here is sign of the sound of the violin. And in time domain, it's you know, wave structure will look like this. Now let's take this wolf note. Clearly, this is not desirable. <laughs> and in the time domain, it goes off like this. So, what causes the wolf note? Before Raman, the standard explanation was that it is a mm, beat between the vibration of the air column and the vibration of the string. That is clearly not something Raman liked, so that's what you know, led him to do many of these experiments. And what Raman proved beyond doubt is that it is actually the body and the bridge of the instrument which goes into violent oscillations, and that is why it becomes difficult to keep the bow steady on top of it. So, this is an example of the you know, records that. You know, Raman obtained from his experiment. So, he put a marker on the body of the violin and a marker on the string and simultaneously recorded on film. And at wolf note, this is what happens. The body suddenly goes into large vibrations, whereas away from wolf note, this does not happen. And this proved beyond doubt that um, uh, wolf note is caused by the vibrations of the body. tackle this problem. So, this problem cannot be tackled without um, uh, compromising the tonal quality of the violin. So, but people use what is called mutes. So, you can put mutes on the string or mutes on, on the bridge and then uh, um, uh, you can play, but that will affect somewhere else in the tonal quality. So, um, uh, it is not a problem which has been resolved in that sense. But bypassing that problem for some specific uh, set of nodes that you want to produce, that has been done. So, in a particular composition, you may not need to produce nodes in a certain region. So, you put a mute and then you can continue to play that. <coughs> No, the, I mean, uh, is both string instruments, right? Yes, yeah. the violin family itself. It is uh, you go from violin, violin to viola to cello to double bass and so on, right? So uh, the instrument keeps getting bigger and bigger, and uh, so the resonance will come at a different point. But when you go to a bigger instrument, you are also looking for lower frequencies. So the, in, uh, in a ratio, it remains similar. Okay, so this is one paper he wrote on struck string, which is a pianoforte, and uh, this is basically extending the existing theory of struck string. And primary content of this paper is that they numerically computed the force exerted by hammer at any arbitrary striking point, and noted that duration of contact is discontinuous function of striking point. So this is what they expected from their mathematical analysis and then of course, a paper is never complete without going to an experiment, doing the experiment, exp reporting the result. All his papers are like that and here is the result and here is the demonstration. I will not go much into it because it does not really form a very key part of his musical work. What I will come to 
is this because he really uncovered some interesting aspects of Indian drums. So Indian musical drums like the tabla or mridangam has one specific characteristic that the playing surface is loaded in the center or off center with a black tuning paste it's called. <clears throat> and you also have an annular rim of a second piece of skin around the <clears throat> around the playing surface. Now both these has important effects and then I will illustrate that in a few moments. So let's take a pure circular drum which is used often in western orchestra it's called a kettle drum and this is how it sounds like if you do a harmonic analysis <clears throat> this is the time domain this is the frequency domain in, uh, structure of this you can take a small piece of it near the peak and expand it you find this it's basically a very large dispersion of frequencies you don't get very characteristic harmonically spaced notes here and once you allow this to subside a little bit so these extraneous vibrations go away and then the long lived vibrations are along these lines these are these correspond to different vibrational modes of the circular circular membrane they are not in harmonic ratio the frequencies of these vibrations are not in ra integer ratios and these are the uh, ratios is 1 1.59 2.1 2.23 2.65 2 and so on and so forth you can yeah, read it. The these are the zeros of behavior function that's all these are basically zeros of behavior functions so this is the in the equation you solve and zeros are basic functions will give you this. Okay, so now let's look at a tabla. Okay, so that is the kind of sound it produces. It's this is the time domain structure, and you can clearly see what I'm coming to. In the frequency domain, it sounds it looks like this discard this initial part which has to come which comes from the left hand side in the instrument which is in the bass instrument but <coughs> this is what is coming from this particular object oh i took the primary note and then they divided all the frequencies by that so these differences are the unit of frequency that I have divided it by. So now it's clearly it's just to show that these are at integer integer points otherwise you will not appreciate whether they are at integer multiples or not. So how did this happen? This is also a circular memory. Just to compare this is what we saw as a function of circular memory and earlier. Now, if you find the normal, normal modes of the tabla, they happen to be this, 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. Now, what is happening, you can see, are some of the modes are changing their frequency, either raising or lowering and merging into modes which are which have harmonic relation to the fundam fundamental. And this happens because it has got a central load. So it is no longer a free circular membrane, but it is loaded at the center. If it is loaded properly, then you can make these mm, uh, modes sort of merge to uh, mm, uh, harmonic frequencies. It will keep, it will keep on deviating afterwards as you go to higher and higher modes. So what do you do? You put a flap around the side and damp out those uh, higher modes. So you just mm, remove those higher modes which have larger oscillations towards the edges by putting a 
um, uh, flap around the side. And that is how he managed to get this more musical sound of Indian drums. These are some Cladney figures, which is there in Amos papers, also produced by striking a tabla. And uh, he would take these figures and then measure the frequency. And that is how he identifies which frequency is for which mode. And, uh, and that's what gave the figure that I uh, showed on the previous page. So experimentally verified. Well, he did not actually solve the differential equation for a loaded membrane to show exactly what frequencies that you will get. Okay, that was left for later entrants in the field. And I found that in 2012, people are still writing about it. So, so this is a slight generalization where they put two, two loads on a circular membrane, but you can take the limit where uh, one of the loads go to zero size, and that is on this left axis of this. And here they solve the differential equation numerically, and then uh, find the frequencies. And you can see here that this is 2.5, 5, 7.5, 10. And as you go to higher modes, the frequencies begin to differ. And if you put a amplitude damper on the sides, those frequencies will be absent. It doesn't damp. It changes the mass distribution. So therefore, your uh, um, uh, modal frequencies are no longer at the zeros of the Bessel function for a free membrane. So, <coughs> You will have to solve this coupled the equation. Zeros are trigonometric yeah. It, it is not exactly zeros of trigonometric function, but it's close to that. It's close to that. So you will have to now solve coupled differential equations for the central part and the outer part and match them at the boundary. Right? And uh, so the outer part is now an annulus, not a circular membrane. And the central part is a circular membrane with a different. Uh, uh, mass per unit area. So once you do that and match it at the boundary, you will get these uh, equations. And then with suitable uh, adjustment of the load, you can make them <coughs> harmonic. OK. So now, that's about drums. I'll not come back to drums then. He also talked about some Indian string instruments. He found that that is also of some interest, it produces a sound of different in character than Western musical instruments. For example, the Tanpura. It is very rich in overtones, as you can see here. And also the Veena. Again, a sound which is rather rich in overtones. So to compare, you take a guitar or a violin, these are much sparser in overtones than Veena or Tanpura. Now, why does this happen? Now, he then went and looked at the construction of these instruments. And the striking difference between these instruments and uh, the Western musical instruments is the uh, design of the bridge. The, uh, guitar or a violin, the um, uh, string will pass over a knife edge, which is, the, which is the bridge. Whereas here, the bridge is a long curved thing like this. So now, we know that if you have a stretched string between two points, you will have uh, the vibrations which will follow this young Helmholtz law. So you'll have fundamental first harmonic with a node in the, mid in the middle, and then a second harmonic with you know, two nodes at one third the length, and so on. And excitations which require you know, movement at the nodes will not be excited. <coughs> Suppose 
you bow it or you pluck it at a given point in the string. Modes that have node at that point will not be excited. So, if you demand that a mode will have zero displacement at the point where I am plucking, it is not possible in a standard stretch string. Whereas, experimentally he found that in both Veena and Tanpura, it does not matter where you pluck. Finally, you will get the same richness of nodes. So, it allows development, gradual development of modes which violate this law. And the reason for that is that the point of contact here is not one point. So, as the string vibrates, the point of contact is moving with the bridge. And it that striking of the bridge, striking of the string on the bridge at multiple points allows additional overtones to be generated. Okay. Yeah, with slightly variable length. And at, at given time, you have one length. But yeah, something. <clears throat> but the striking of this on the bridge is also transferring the energy into that mode. Yes, a certain part of the length of the bridge, yeah. It is not a single point contact, yeah. Initially, when the string is stationary, there is one point which is fixed, right? Which is a tangent to the bridge, right? But now, when you pluck it and it moves, then the point of contact will keep changing. Hmm? That will depend on the curvature of the design of the bridge. At any given time, it is touching something, and this range is not a very large range, it is not over the whole string. It's, uh, it's a small range, but small range carefully tuned to generate these uh, additional harmonics. I'm sure a lot of trial and error has gone into shaping the bridge so that you get the correct tonal quality. Hmm? Everything will damp over some time, so you have to keep uh, keep exciting energy. Yeah, that is why an expert instrument maker is needed. Right. So, to know all about what Raman thought about musical instruments, this is an important uh, compilation of his uh, commentary on all musical instruments, Indian and Western, every single class of instrument that was known at that time. Include, it covers board strings, struck strings, pluck string, wind instruments, percussions, including belts. Okay. It is 71 pages, with, in, uh, um, uh, largely with in, uh, analytical calculations and in, uh, statement of experimental results. So, anyone wants to enter this field, this is a good point to start. It is almost a little short of 100 years old now, but well, it is a good point to start. Huh? No, no, no. A lot, lot has been done after that. But if you, if you were to start, this, for example, we are still teaching Helmholtz's book in our classroom text, right? So, not a bad point to start. So, to summarize, C. V. Raman was actually an acoustician par excellence and an authority on physics of musical instruments at his time. And his treatise on boasting is a classic and relevant even today. And he revealed the unique nature of Indian drums and some stringed instruments and highlighted the advanced nature of musical knowledge in ancient India. So, that is the end of my talk. Thank you. Yeah, so ultimately it boils down to the uh, timber of the note, and that uh, is the harmonic content. Plus, as, in, as I said in the beginning, uh, it is not only the harmonic content, but for each note when you play, it is envelope. It is rise time, how long it holds and at what, what rate it decays. All of that together produces the musical experience of a, of a note. And 
What mix of this you will have, of course, has to do with the construction of the instrument and how you excite the modes in the. Finally, it's how you excite the air column, which is reaching. And you are able to distribute all those molecules which you call the diaphragm. That is correct. Because now you synthesize the sound. Finally, as I said, that it will have to be the air column that is reaching you. The air column that is reaching the diaphragm is being manipulated in a way to you know, replicate the effect of these you know, instruments per se. Now, if I have to uh, record, uh, if you consider man or something, I can put a microphone, pass it to an oscilloscope and uh, record. And also, what kind of technologies or experimental setup uh, similar have? Yes, so those pictures that you saw, those are the vibrations of the string directly. Right? So, he would put, he did it both in uh, a shadow or, uh, or in reflection. So, in shadow what he would do, uh, he would have a narrow slit and um, the string will pass behind it or pass just in, in, uh, in front of it and it will be lit from behind. And he would have a box where there will be a photographic film and this film will be pulled at a constant rate. And the string vibrates, right? So the sh so we get a sh shadow which is white everywhere, but where the light is blocked, you get a shadow. And this moves up and down, and as the film progresses, it just gets drawn out into a. So that gives you the picture of vibration as a function of time at a given point. You mentioned about this uh, recent paper where they matched this boundary condition solving these equations. What exactly Raman did in his analytical calculation? No, in analytical calculation, he wrote down the differential equation. He did not solve it. He said, now I will go to these uh, players and then make Ladney figures and uh, I'll note down the frequency. I'll measure the frequency and measure mm, and experimentally look at the mode and then note down what is the corresponding frequency. So, mm, uh, he did not solve the differential equation. So, he just did an experiment to give the mm, uh, corresponding figures. Yeah. Yes, it's in sand, I think. Yeah. You mean these Latin figures, right? This sand, <coughs> fine sand. So you see, this is how it is done. You see that somebody is holding three fingers and then you're striking it. So you make the nodes there, and then you get a figure like that, and then you measure the frequency of it. So you excite a node, measure its frequency. And that is how you get to the uh, get to the table. So you talked about central loading. So what exactly is the material? Ah, so this is an, an, uh, ferric oxide. It's an iron-based compound and uh, some kind of gum. It's a vegetable gum and uh, an iron-based uh, ferric oxide or. Uh, <coughs> Ferrous oxide. No, it's uh, you need something heavy, right, and sticky. Iron is among the heaviest you can get cheaply, and using the gum you make it sticky so that it will not fall apart in use. They, we do. Uh, just in a few days ago, I was uh, seeing a television program where. Uh, Somebody has made a tabla which is three feet high. Mm -hmm. Diameter, you can make it, I suppose. But nothing prevents you from doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and, uh, you can take it to such large size that the frequency will go below your audible range. So it, uh, it will not be of much use. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, give a specific instrument, we can produce a certain sound, like 
for tabla it can't produce a sound like a guitar of course so but uh, our speakers can produce simultaneously at a time uh, uh, like lot of sounds at particular time so how is that like a speaker the speaker is electronically excited right so there is no limit to what kind of excitation that you need to uh, that you can give to a speaker so it's uh, when you give electrical voltages to a speaker uh, you can uh, just combine all types of vibration and give it but a particular instrument is limited by its construction as to what type of vibration it, you can excite in it <coughs> So how did he measure the exact change of tension on this uh, membrane? Like he did not measure the change, uh, change of tension. Because the tabla players usually change the tension on the membrane. Like no, so, uh, usually you uh, set a tension. On, this is the uh, right hand side instrument. You set a tension and then you play. And then you can uh, readjust the tension to produce another note. So the fundamental can be different. The fundamental has uh, a clear uh, one to one correspondence with tension that right? because this is the tension you change the tension the fundamental frequency will change yes i had a comment and i have a question too. yes please if you go back to the picture of the tanpura yeah the point of contact on the bridge is also varied by a piece of fiber that yes that is correct so let me just that is the fiber and he does he does comment on that uh, not in his paper i haven't found that in his paper because uh, different regions in india use different fibers okay. in the south they use cotton and here they use wool and i i've never been able I to see. understand okay. why no no i maybe i missed it but i don't recall a statement to that effect as to effect of the fiber on the quality of fiber on this uh, tone of mm. but i'm sure I'm, people must have done a lot of work since ram is we're talking about a century ago right? so <clears throat> you should be able to find some work in this mridangam yeah so um, uh, it is yeah so it's slightly different because uh, the air column is being excited from both sides simultaneously in the same instrument Mm, uh, but the harmonicity remains the same and that is because in, uh, the central loading and the peripheral uh, obstruction are both present also in the mridanga oh that one yeah yeah so he makes some comment on it and he says uh, it is not necessarily meant to produce a harmonic vibration because it's a percussion instrument right you tune one to your uh, vocalist or whatever but uh, a percussion instrument does not have to always produce a uh, uh, harmonic note but if you need you can place the uh, place your base of your palm properly so that you can isolate a region which is centered around that uh, load and you can still create uh, harmonic vibrations more detail than this i don't have any Yes. So, as I said, right in the beginning, the what characterizes the musical note is the pitch, which is the frequency, but it is also the timbre, which is the harmonic and overtone content. And I showed you an example, right? That. so these two notes they will be considered the same frequency but the 
the frequency content is different. <coughs> the overtone content is different. The dominant frequency is the same. So two instruments, you can tune them to produce the same dominant frequency, but the harmonic content will always be different. And that gives the character to the instrument. And uh, as I also meant, mentioned, that today we know that it is not just this. It is also the envelope of the node that is produced. Right? Thank you very much. <coughs>